All righty. Oh, I love that. That was perfect. <laughs> okay, so I'm going to get started with our final session. <clears throat> All right, so our final session focuses on the media under the topic, News We Can Use. Three experts will enlighten us about the state of the media in Kansas and nationwide. Our speakers are Jason Probst, a current member of the Kansas House of Representatives for the 102nd District in Hutchinson. <laughs> Woohoo! <laughs> Prior to his election, Jason worked for 15 years as a reporter and editor for the Hutchinson News. Yes. The next person, Jeff Jarman, director of the Elliott School of Communication at Wichita State University. He was formerly director of debate at WSU. Yes, yes. <laughs> His interests lie in the influence of political debates and fact-checking for an informed public. And last but not least, Tom Shine, KMUW News and, yes, and Public Affairs Director. Um, he will replace Jim McLean today, so that's pretty amazing, but sad at the same time. <laughs> Tom is highly qualified newsman having spent 37 years at the Wichita Eagle in various reporting and editing roles. His goal at the station is to promote insightful discussion and a better understanding of key issues facing Wichita and Kansas. Please welcome our speakers. Well, I wanna, I wanna start off by saying that I'm really glad you did the dance routine beforehand. <laughs> That's a good icebreaker. But we were discussing up here that it's uh, probably not the best place to be uh, the last thing before happy hour. <laughs> so we'll get to working on that, uh, speed through this. The slides, I, we were having some technical difficulties with video, but I think we're good now. So there we got it. All right. So which one hits it? Nobody showed me how to use this. Is it this one? Oh, wait. That was the wrong button. <laughs> yeah, that's what I thought. Okay. Wait. There we go. Okay. There. I was doing it. Oh, I'm holding it upside down. That's the thing. Okay. <laughs> Got it. All right. So... Uh, just a real quick thing, as I'm Jason Probst, I worked for the Hutch News for 15 years, uh, first as a page designer, then as a reporter, and then as an editor, and I ended my career there as an editorial writer, and that's kind of a rare thing anymore that somebody's employed most, most of the time to write editorials. Um, so, and I was just kind of being a little funny here and said, why are we doing this? Well, because there's not many reporters left anymore. One of the things I want to point out is, the, just if you look in a general sense, the, the employment in media has dropped pretty significantly over the years. And this goes back to 1990, where we had over 400,000 people employed in media newsrooms, particularly, and it's dropped uh, considerably since then. This goes to 2016, so it's probably gotten worse. In fact, I know it has, because there was actually, even my former employer, they, they took some voluntary buyouts just this week. Every year it seems this is, you know, we're seeing fewer and fewer working journalists. And there's a number of reasons for that, and, and for years people have been trying to figure out why, and there are a lot of reasons. I put the blame specifically on uh, one key area that we'll get to a little bit later, but a lot of it, we recognized early that people weren't buying newspapers like they used to. There were other games in town, and you could get it online, and now you can get it on your phone real, really easy, and you don't, you, it just pushed to you, so you don't even have to go look for it. Um, there's also that it became a very attractive, some of these mid-sized papers became very attractive to investors, um, to hedge funds basically. Uh, we have polarization, which has actually created kind of profitable media opportunities, but only if it's, you've, you've sliced up opinion into very small portions. And then social media has eroded this, and I watched this at the Hutch News, and I, I saw this kind of 
sense of frustration come over myself and other people that work there because the expectation was is that we would share the news that we produced online, not just online, but on social media. And then I would start to see people, when we'd put a headline that would link back to a story, they would say, well, how come you're not giving us the whole story on Facebook? Well, because we don't make money on Facebook. Facebook makes money on Facebook. We don't. But we were training readers at that point to expect the news to come to them via their social media feeds and for free. And then I put on here, too, because I think this is the thing that we, we, we're kind of seeing in, in the industry, particularly in newspapers. It's the uh, retail collapse, or what we're hearing termed the retail apocalypse. Uh, as big national retailers start to shrink, they have always been a primary advertiser for newspapers. I have it the right way this time. Um, I just pulled a couple of headlines that I, that I found nationally of what's going on. So you, you have, and I won't read them all, but you, you can look at any company. I'm probably going to pick on Gatehouse today because that's the company that bought my former employer, and I know more about that from a first-person view. But all over the country, McClatchy, Gannett, Tronk, uh, which is the Chicago Tribune's reimagining of itself, um, these companies are going, they have just been on a crusade, and it's, it's a cost-cutting crusade, and it's an effort to just cut these newsrooms down to, in some cases, almost to nothing. I pulled this, already, I won't read all this, but I saw this headline from a column in, in Bloomberg, and I found it very interesting. Imagine if Gordon Gecko, do you remember the, that, that movie, uh, Wall Street? If he bought news empires. And in some ways, that's what's happening. And like I said, I won't read the whole thing, but basically this is telling the story of uh, Al Alden Global, which owns new media news group, which owned the Denver Post, Salt Lake City Tribune, some very big, some very reputable papers. And basically he laid out in this column that what they were doing is they were pulling money out of these newspaper groups and moving them into other investments that weren't performing all that well. And uh, the last paragraph that I have down there talks about how they were in a suit because they had uh, invested $80 million in a company that... Uh, was a really big fraud, you know, a proponent of, not a proponent, but they, they were committing fraud. And they just, they take this money out of well-performing newspapers and then they move it to other things. So there is kind of a, a narrative out there that, oh, newspapers are struggling, and they are. They're seeing lower profit margins than they did before. They're seeing lower readership, and they do have those struggles. But one of the, strugg one of the things that's making it harder for newspapers to do what they did before is that they're largely being purchased by companies that are siphoning off money. And the company that bought the Hutchison News and the Harris chain was Gatehouse. And I'll just deviate a little bit and share the personal story. I remember when Gatehouse bought us, um, the president of the division came in and said, you will not notice any differences. We're gonna, we'll, you, you, it'll be just like nothing ever happened. And I do remember at the time when they announced it was, you know, I'm not known for being quiet in the right situations. Um, so... My boss texted me as soon as they announced that it was Gatehouse and said, try to be positive. And <laughs> I was not positive. But I had always suspected it was going to be Gatehouse because they were, on, I mean, they were buying a lot of papers the size of ours. One of the things about newspapers is they cash flow very well. They may not be making the profits that they'd like to make, but there is money coming into a newspaper every single day, whether it's through subscriptions or whether it's through print advertising or whether it's through classified advertising, they churn a lot of money through newspapers. And so these investment firms really like this because they, they, can flow, they can pull that cash flow in for other things that aren't cash flowing so well. One thing Gatehouse does, and part of their overall strategy that I've seen, is that they really want to try to pull back in some of these national advertisers. So if they can sell their advertising regionally instead of community by community, they can pull in some of the advertisers and, and offer a, a bigger pool of readers and for, their subscribe, for their advertisers. So they'll do that. Before I left uh, the Hutch News, I told some of the people that I was leaving behind that the, the news is no longer the product that we produce. Revenue is the product. News is simply the package that it's put in. It's like uh, anything else that you buy. You buy the, you buy the Coca-Cola, you don't buy the bottle it's in. Um, but we were no longer the product. And that hadn't been the case before then. The, but it was very clearly, and if you watch it, you can see, it clearly is 
they come in with a heavy focus on how to leverage all of their assets to generate the most revenue. And news is just an unnecessary, or a, a necessary evil, I think, in their minds of what they have to perform. Um, and I, I was, one thing I looked up that I did include this slideshow that was actually a concern to me is the Gatehouse New Media, they, I kind of use them interchangeably, they're the same company. They just purchased an events planning company. So they specialize in doing like these tough mutters, you know, where you run and you cross over muddy holes and climb up wire fences and everything. And they purchased one of those. And the reason that concerned me is because we have like a recreation commission that puts on some things like that. And I can see a scenario where they get a company like that and they start to want to use that to put on events and they use their media properties to promote the events and they're very good at that. They're very, make no mistake about it, companies like Gatehouse are very good at business. They're not very good at news, but they're very good at business. Am I holding it upside down again? <laughs> okay. This is where we had technical difficulty, so we'll see if this works out. Um, but I wanted to say it's not just it's not just newspapers, there's a, a thing happening in TV too, and this was a video that's made the rounds before and I wanted to put this out. If we can play it, we'll see if it works.
and that they serve no political agenda. This is extremely dangerous to our democracy. 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 Okay. So that was a little longer than I intended, but I think it's an important illustration of kind of what's happening. No matter the platform, whether, whether it's Gatehouse Media, which we'll talk about here, Sinclair, AT&T, and Time Warner merging, you're starting to see a huge consolidation of media. And some of that can be a little more, you know, can be couched in terms that's a little more sinister, like the Sinclair example. Some of it is just not quite that sinister. There's not like a coordinated effort or anything. But what I saw with Gatehouse was that you get less reporting and you get less quality simply by a reduction of resources. When you don't have people on staff, you don't have local people on staff, you don't have people who are invested in your community, you start to see a real reduction in the information, the quality information. So this, Lynn was very excited to have this up here about the number of papers that Gatehouse has acquired. When they purchased Harris, they, they received Hutchinson, Salina, Garden City, Ottawa and Hayes, and also one in Iowa. Um, they, before that, owned a handful of weeklies. They now own Leavenworth and Topeka Cap Journal. So where we, they're all over the state, and there's a lot of sharing that goes on with information, just like there, was, like there is, like we explained with the advertising, there's a lot of sharing that goes on with news and information. So before where you had Hutch News, maybe had its reporters and had somebody dedicated to the state house looking at things from a Hutchinson perspective. Now there's a lot of sharing. If Hutchinson carries, carries something, they might have carried, covered before, they might just take Topeka Cab Journal's story because they want to share those resources and streamline those operations. And that's part of what happens here is you start to, you'll start to see more of a, instead of an individual community approach to this, to this journalism, you'll start to see more of a kind of regional approach to it. I just ran down a list of things that I thought were really bad uh, for communities whenever you start to see this. And I, I guess I want to make a distinction too. I've, when, I left Gate, when I left Gatehouse, left Hutch News, I felt very bad for the people that were still working there. Because they're trying to do their job and they're trying to do it very well. And in most cases, they still are. But they're doing it against increasingly difficult odds. Um, you know. Three more people that I know of took a voluntary buyout this week. And if that doesn't satisfy what Gatehouse needed to cut, there'll be more layoffs. And that means that every reporter that's left there is now going to be asked to do more to cover broader topics. When I took over the newsroom as the editor in 2007, I had one reporter dedicated to city government, another reporter dedicated to county government, another reporter dedicated to education. Those three topics now fall under one reporter now. And you cannot cover that, you can't cover any one of those topics with any depth at all, if you're doing it with one person. The other thing that happens is uh, you, you start to shift the focus online and that system rewards short, kind of sensational articles, more, more so than depth and deeper explanation of any topic. So you'll start to see, and you probably have noticed them already, I mean, you, we hear about the, the clickbait terms, right? If you have a sensational headline, you want to click on it. You go more to listicles, which is an article that's just done as a list. Um, you start to gravitate towards things that readers have shown they like. And that's a whole nother, that could do a whole nother slideshow presentation on algorithms and how that works. But one of the bigger things for me that, that, that worries me is, f from a community perspective, is this extraction of wealth. I mean, they come in and their whole goal is to kind of extract the money that's available, whether it's advertising revenue or event revenue or whatever it might be, and pull that out, and, and they're very good at it. Um, the other problem, the other thing I really worry about is this information vacuum. Whenever you're not getting good reporting from people who are invested in their community, who were looking out for the community. And that's when, when I was there, I had a lot of people who disagreed with me. A lot of people did agree with me, but a lot didn't. But I think everyone recognized that I had a vested interest in my community and that I cared about it. So even if I was critical of something that leadership had done, people recognized that, that it was someone who lived in this community, had raised his children in this community, who had a real interest in what happened there. 
I don't, I think that we're not seeing that. We also had local leadership. Our publisher lived there and our managing editors live there. And the managing editor at Hutch still lives there, but the publisher doesn't. And they, they'll reassign these guys every couple of years if they need to, because they really don't want them becoming embedded in the community. The other thing, this is a lesser thing, but I, I worry about this a lot because some of the things I do now, I'm writing plays for our local theater group, and I rely heavily on historical newspaper articles. And I have a real concern that we're not gonna be able to find 100 years from now, what are we gonna be able to go back and find from an archival point of view? I mean, I can go back, now granted, 100 years ago, I can hardly find anything written about women. I can find a lot written about men. But I, and I can find a, no, a mention of Mrs. So-and-so, um, but I can't find much on them. I, but that was part of what it was at the time. But these historical archives are not going to be present 100 years from now when we want to look back, uh, partly because they've been digitized, and that's okay. We, you know, digitized archives are good. But just from the content perspective, we used to see ourselves... We would report things that we thought, ah, it's marginally interesting, but it's a historical preservation of something that happened, and we need to keep that going. So I have a real worry about that. And then I'll see if this plays like it should. So what can we do? Is it gonna play? Oh, wait. Oh, that's a laser. I don't know. Can you try to, is there a play button on there? Oh, okay. It's supposed to be a guy shrugging. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, there you go. Uh, <laughs> a few years ago, uh, right, after, right after Gatehouse bought the news, there was a, a group, of us that, uh, group of us that talked about what could we do. We were really worried about the, what was happening with news coverage. We were worried because there were just layoffs happening one after another. There, and it's still happening, but it was happening at a breakneck pace then. And we got together and said, How, what can we do about this? And we couldn't find much that was really viable. I mean, we just we kind of put our brains together and couldn't come up with anything. There are some good examples, though, that give me hope. Uh, some foundations, the healthcare foundations around the state are recognizing that there's a need to do some, to finance some quality reporting, and they're doing that. Uh, community foundations, I don't know that they're starting to fund this yet, but I've heard enough conversations from within community foundations that I think that in a few years you'll start to see at a community level some foundations start to pick up the slack and say, we want to we want to help finance the reporting and the recording of history in our community. Um, and then I, I'd be remiss if I didn't mention a friend of mine, Joey Young, who has targeted small papers, and he is on a buying spree. He's buying little weekly papers all over McPherson County, Harvey County, and Hes uh, Marion County. And he's small, but I'm kind of watching what he's doing, and it's encouraging because he's returned focus back to we're going to do community-based journalism that's really focused here on your town. We're going to have somebody here that's reporting all these things. And I, the fact that he, he actually just purchased three more papers, and he acquired one in McPherson, so he's one of the few examples that I'm seeing that, that it's growing. As far as what you can do, I think there's a vacuum of information because the reporters aren't able to provide it. I think that you, you have to kind of watch for that. And you if you're involved in things and you can share those with the few reporters that are left, or if you can volunteer to write columns or editorials or op-ed pieces for your paper, I think that's helpful. One thing I can say is when they cut staff, they end up being starved for content. And they're particularly starved for local content. So if you have a voice and you're involved in things in your community and you know about them and you want to share that information, I think you can take that to the paper and they'll most likely run it um, because they really do need the content. Normally, I do this sort of presentation in a question and answer format, so I don't exactly know how to wrap it up. But uh, I'll just probably should stop talking and let the other guys go. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs>